I begin this evening's uh, talk. Usually, when we give talks uh, on a Friday evening, we try to, to bring the theory of Buddhism to life by taking an aspect of the, the Buddhist path, especially the meditative path, and show how it can be applied in, first of all, daily life, to bring a, a greater sense of ease and peace, solving problems in your life but also to take it deeper into finding out some of the religious truths of life, finding out what's really going on. And the subject I want to talk about this evening is uh, the mindfulness which is focused on the body. And this is a traditional practice uh, of Buddhism, a meditative practice, focusing mindfulness on the body. And it's done uh, in many different ways. Uh, in order to solve problems, to get to understand what's going on, to free the mind and also to develop uh, huge amounts of wisdom and peace in life. I always say that the measure of wisdom is how much peace it produces. What's the use of wisdom, ideas, knowledge, if it doesn't work to cre uh, create these wonderful qualities in a person's lifestyle? So the measure of wisdom is peace. And so if these teachings are worthwhile. If they do really create wisdom, they should also create a sense of stillness and peace in the mind. So the mindfulness on the body is one of these ways to develop uh, wisdom which creates peace, solves problems in life. When we talk about mindfulness, it's an alertness, but an alertness which one can be sustained and secondly, which can be focused in the right place and thirdly, which is powerful. <laughs> because a lot of times that when we talk about mindfulness, this awareness, this clarity of the mind, very often it's, uh, it's not sustained at all. The mind wanders from one thing to another and how, how can you expect it to really know what's going on? The knowing because of the mind always flitting from one thing to another always becomes so superficial. It never stays long enough on one thing. It was an uh, experience which I had many years ago when I was... Uh, living at the monastery at Serpentine, and those of you who have been to that monastery know that it's on top of a hill. And from the bottom of the hill to the top is a two-kilometer walk. Uh, it's traditional for holy people to live up on a hill, as I keep saying. You never hear of holy people living in swamps. It's just not the done thing. So if you want to, <laughs> so if you want to find holy people, you always go up a hill somewhere. And... For most of my early life as a monk living in that monastery, I'd always go up and down in vehicles. People were so kind that they'd drive me up, they'd drive me down. And it happened one day that I was coming back from a teaching trip in Bunbury on the bus, and I told the monk, I said, look, it's a lovely day. When the bus you know, drops me at the bottom of Kingsby Drive, I walk up. I had plenty of time, and when I walked up that first morning, something struck me very deeply, which was that, having gone up and down that road so many times, when I walked up, it was going up a different road. The scenery was completely different to anything I'd experienced before. And straight away, when these strange events happen, you reflect quite deeply. Why is it that I've been up that road many times in a vehicle, but when I walk, it looks completely different? So I stopped. And when I stopped, the scenery changed once more. What was happening is that when you go up in a car, you're going so fast, all you see is flashes of scenery through the window. When you're walking, you're going much slower, so that every piece of scenery as a chance to imprint it itself on your consciousness with more faithfulness to the reality. And when you stop, you're not even going at all. Then you can see so deeply into the what's happening around you that you get the full picture. When you're going fast, you only get flashes of reality. When you slow down, reality starts to fill in the gaps. When you stop, you see the whole picture. That's what I found in walking up or riding in a car or standing still going up that road. And it similarly relates to what we call mindfulness. When the mind is flitting from one thing to another going so fast, you never really understand what's going on. Just flashes. 
go <laughs> flashes of your consciousness, never lasting long enough to fe- really you know, get a full picture. The slow you go, the more powerful is mindfulness. And if you can at all stop, then mindfulness has a time, has a space, has a power to really inform you of what's going on. So sustaining mindfulness is so important. The ability to point your attention on one thing and keep it there. In other words, the stillness of the mind. So that's one of the first things we practice in meditation, be able to develop that degree of mindfulness so we can focus it and it becomes still on the point of focus. And secondly, we empower the mindfulness. So often our mindfulness is very weak because we're tired, because we're negative, because we really want just to go into dullness, because into dullness we're not feeling the pain, the difficulty, the problems of our life. The second thing with mindfulness, we need to empower it. And what really empowers mindfulness is the joy, the happiness. Putting energy into life means enjoying this moment. Literally seeking out what is beautiful in this moment. What I call in my monastery in Serpentine, developing the perception of the beautiful. Whatever you look at, there's a whole range of possible perceptions in that object. You can look upon it as being ugly, distasteful, I don't want to look at it, I don't want to see it, I don't want to hear it. Or you can actually choose to look at the beauty in that object. And if you choose to look at the beauty of that object, you find that mindfulness gets brighter and brighter and brighter. You can see more and more and more. You're putting happiness into perception. That's the second thing with mindfulness, to be able to, to put this energy, this joy into what you're doing. And that's just the training of the mind, that's all. And the third thing with mindfulness, you have to know what to focus it on. What's really going to be an effective use of this power of the mind? of you know, powerful knowing and sustaining that knowing on one thing. And so here we're talking about developing that mindfulness nice and strong and sustaining it on this body of ours. In other words, the experiences in the body, the feelings in the body, the aches, the pains, the stresses, the, the whatever else is happening inside your physical frame. And it becomes extremely important to be able to focus on the body to get to have a good understanding of the emotional world because that emotional world, whether it's anger, fear, guilt or even love, positive and negative emotions, they do have an effect upon your body. And a lot of times the best way of understanding those emotions and solving the problem which comes as a consequence of those emotions is by focusing on the body. This is one of the skillful means which we use to overcome these things, such as anger. Whenever a person does get angry, there is a corresponding feeling in the body. And if a person can only focus their mindfulness on the feeling in the body whenever they get angry or irritated, you'll find that that anger will dissipate very quickly And you'll find a sense of freedom from the anger because this is the way it works. Whenever you get angry, it's always angry at something out there. You get angry at your husband, angry at your wife, angry at your kids, angry at the monk, angry at anybody. You can get angry at anyone. You can get angry at me sometimes. How many times does that bum have to tell that same joke? It really depends you know, what sort of mood you're in. That's another thing which I mentioned about anger. But anger is always about something out there. And I, many times when I've been riding in the vehicle coming up to this centre, you get caught at a traffic light and how often is it that you feel, you see people in the cars next to you getting angry at the traffic lights. I've seen people shaking their fists at the traffic lights. And I can read their minds. What they're saying is traffic light. Why was it you let the car in front of me through, but you stopped just for me? You saw me coming, didn't you? You got it in for me. You realised I was late and in a hurry this time. And people get very angry at traffic lights, you know. But I use that simile, how you can get angry at traffic lights. So I read in a story in one of the magazines that you've got this thing these days called road rage. 
he would get angry at you for you know some way you drive. You know, you're probably driving just quite normally, but then uh, something happens and just they get angry and upset at you. One of the this case I read about in the newspapers was in New York, and this uh, this one fellow got into road rage, and when the two cars drew up at a traffic light next to each other, one of the guys got out of his car and started banging on the window of the other man's car. He was just so upset and so angry. But as anyone should realize, if you get out of your car with your door open and engine running in New York, <laughs> you can know what's going to happen next. A street kid was walking past and saw the car unoccupied, got into the empty door, closed it, and drove off. And so this person in road rage was standing in the middle of the road watching his car being driven away. Serves him right. That's what happens when you get angry. <laughs> instant, instant karma. So we can get angry at so many things. And why is that the case? Because we don't realize the, what's happening with anger. We don't realize its effects. And we get caught time and time again. We may not lose our car. We may lose all our friends. And at least we'll probably lose our health when we get angry at these other things. Anger is always illogical, irrational. Because number one, it doesn't really help you or help the situation. You can be far more effective when you don't get crazy with anger. And number two, sort of, uh, you won't be able to really appreciate what the situation is. You get mad in anger. You're not really seeing the, the, the causes of it. So instead of focusing on the cause outside of your anger, the traffic light outside, that driver, my husband, the weather, the government, or whatever else, which is all things out there. Instead, you can actually focus your mindfulness, all that energy, all that power, all that attention on inside of you. When you're really angry at someone else, how do you feel? Try and find a sensation in the body which corresponds to that anger. How do you feel when you get angry? You find there's a common feeling, a sensation, an experience in your body, even centered on a particular area of your body, which occurs every time you get angry, upset, irritated at something else. Once you start focusing on that experience, on that feeling, things start to change. First of all, it's just a little skillful means, a little trick to take your attention from out there inside. What happens is as soon as you're focusing on how it feels inside, rather than that person or that person or that traffic light or that outside, you're actually cutting off the fuel which powers anger. When you look upon inside, sort of the source, the cause, the fuel is completely cut off. Because to really sustain anger, to really keep it going, you have to keep on having an object which can fuel hate, which can fuel irritation. You have to have a person or a thing out there to keep it going. Once you start focusing inside, how it feels inside you, you find you can't sustain anger very much, very long at all. That's why Ajahn Chah, full of skillful means, and very... Um, original skillful means at that when someone many years ago asked him about how they can cure their own problem of anger and he just told them to get one of the little travelling clocks, the travelling alarm clocks which people have and carry it around with them and the next time they get angry Ajahn Chah said sit down, put the clock in front of you and see if you can beat your record of how long you can be angry for just see how long you can be angry just put the clock in front of you and time it Straight away, the person found that when they sat there were angry at somebody, they put the clock in front of them, they watched the clock, they weren't watching the source of anger anymore. They couldn't stay angry very long at all. Because to keep anger going, you have to keep focusing on the trigger, on what you take to be the cause. And as soon as that person, that thing, disappears, anger cannot sustain itself. In the same way, when you start watching... The feelings in the body. You can't keep anger going. 
the second reason why you can't keep anger going, because when you start to experience the feelings in the body, you'll always notice that those feelings which are associated with anger are extremely unpleasant. It's like a tightness in the body, like a fire in the body. And it's incredibly unpleasant to be angry at somebody else. Most people don't notice the feelings of anger. They only notice the object of anger. Him, her, my husband, my wife, my kids, the traffic light. If you notice how it feels inside of you, if you're not watching the, the object of anger, but the subject of anger, you, straight away you feel just how painful it is. And it's something you, which you, can shock you very quickly. Think, wow, I'm actually really hurting here. And if you notice that feeling of anger inside of you long enough, you can really see how, if you don't let go of that feeling pretty quickly, that tension, that tightness, that hard knot inside your body will very soon lead to all sorts of sicknesses and ailments in the body. Actually feeling the body rather than feeling out there. So often sicknesses which occur in the world, they start off as small things and if you could only be aware of your body, you'd notice them as they're, they're growing and you could stop them before it's too late. The body is always telling you to slow down, always telling you to relax, always telling you that something's wrong sometimes. But because we're always somewhere else, never with our body, never having mindfulness on our body, we never notice these things until sometimes it's too late. So when you start to develop the mindfulness on the body, even just watching the feelings associated with anger, you can actually do something about this. You feel, yeah, there's a whole problem here. And you realize that because that person or that thing, you think that they've sort of hurt you. Okay, they may have said something wrong, they may have done something wrong, but now you're hurting yourself. You feel to see the experience in the body, the sensations in the body. Oh, my goodness, they're painful. They're hurting. Why are you allowing someone else to control your happiness or rather to control your lack of happiness when you come to grips or come to see those feelings in the body which are associated whenever you get angry straight away you understand what the problem is you see that it's a problem and from that point you start to let go you start to relax and those feelings in the body will disappear and so will the anger towards that person it's coming to the center, coming to you, how these things appear on the body. And that is the same with other experiences in the body, the opposite of anger, loving kindness. If you can feel what it's like inside of you when you're kind to someone else, when you're generous, when you do an act of selflessness. See if you can associate that action with feelings in your body and you just notice how pleasurable that feels. Just how the body tends to open up rather than close. How things start to flow in the body rather than things get stuck and stopped and congested in the body. Whenever you have a moment of love and forgiveness, kindness, you can actually feel, if you're mindful of the body, things start to flow. There's a sense of openness, a softness, a lightness in this body. Straight away you can see just without being a, a doctor how conducive that is to physical health. Our love is good for you. Our kindness, softness, that keeps the body healthy. You can feel that. You don't need to actually to examine it. You can know that as your own sensation. And so it starts to show you why these things are called wholesome, good, helpful to your health and well-being. And other sort of emotions which come up also have those sensations, even things like guilt and fear. <coughs> guilt and fear are emotions which go together because they're just a negativity to the, the future, that's fear, and a negativity to the past, which is guilt. And it's all selective. By selective I mean we look at all the possible things which can go wrong and that's called fear. We never look at the things which can go right. And we always look at the things which have gone wrong, which is called guilt, without looking at the things which have gone right. It's the same action of the mind, only sort of one is 
pointed to the future, the other one is pointed to the past, but whichever one it is, guilt or fear, each one of those, they have a, an associated sensation in the body. So next time you feel afraid, how does it feel in your body when you're really afraid? Or when you feel guilty, how does that feel? Because when you're feeling guilty, say, a lot of the time, again, you're focusing on the objects of that guilt, what you've done, you know, what you didn't do. You're looking, again, out there at the world, at the objects rather than the subjects. You're not really coming in, coming home to find out what's really going on. When you actually come to the center, come in to what's going on, then you actually feel the sensations in the body and the object, that obsession with what you've done wrong or the obsession which might go wrong in the future is taken away, the fuel is turned off and again the guilt and the fear disappear. It's again coming to a present moment awareness, coming home, coming inside and getting in touch with the feelings in the body, the sensations there. And that also works with the sensations of depression as well. Because as our modern society has a huge problem with depression. And again, why are we depressed? Again, it's a mixture of guilt and fear and negativity towards the world. Again, it's focusing out there rather than focusing inside. How you feel when you're depressed. There's a sensation in the body. One of the focuses which I used to do is whenever you get bored. In some of the forest monasteries in Thailand, it was very easy to get bored. Nothing went on there. You see one tree, you see them all. One mosquito was just like the next. The food was just pretty much the same all the day, every day, just really awful. What was on the menu today was on the menu tomorrow. It was slop today, slop tomorrow. <laughs> It was a very boring life. You know, he didn't have any newspapers, he didn't have any TV, he didn't have any... It was very boring. And so it was very, very easy to get stuck in boredom as a monk in Thailand. The place where we were always practicing was the most uninteresting place in the whole of Thailand. It was flat. There wasn't any mountains or valleys. There wasn't any caves in that part of Thailand. And even the forest, the soil was so bad that even the forests were sort of second-rate forests. It was a really boring place to be in. But so you had a lot of trouble with boredom. <laughs> even the chanting we used to do, just, it was always supposed to be in a monotone. You, you know, love the old Gregorian chanting, you know, the, which you hear on the records these days. Then that was really interesting, but just the chant we do was really boring all the time, just monotone. Because, and the clothes everyone used to wear, all the monks the same brown robes, bald heads. And it's supposed to be that way, not stimulating at all. But of course, when you have no stimulation, then you, you very easy to get into boredom. But I found a very wonderful way to overcome boredom. Because when you had boredom, again, it was a negativity to what was out there, your lifestyle. And so I started to focus on my body. What does boredom feel like in the body? Now, once I started focusing on the bodily feelings associated with boredom, you know, just you feel this whole body droop down. You feel just no, no energy in the body. It became incredibly interesting and fascinating. Just know how the body reacts to boredom. In fact, it became so interesting and so fascinating to investigate the body when you're bored. I wasn't bored at all. <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> what I was actually doing again, it's taking a focus from outside there, inside here. And so this was a practice which you can do at any time for any emotion, both positive and negative, to actually to see what these things do to you as a bodily sensation. Now, because human beings in our society are always seeking pleasure and always running away from pain, always seeking just a sense of comfort in their lives, that this is showing you what discomfort in your body is and what comfort and pleasure is. And straight away, you will move away from the negative emotions simply because they're incredibly irritating and uncomfortable for your body. So when a stimulus comes up in the world which should make you bored, which should make you depressed, which should make you upset and angry, 
you feel the feelings in the body, I don't want to go on that trip anymore. Because it hurts. Why would you hurt yourself? The Buddha once taught to his son, Rahula, and he gave this beautiful explanation of basic, you might call it basic Buddhism, I might call it basic common sense. You can actually see it written on the statue outside. Uh, a summary of the whole of the Buddhist teachings. Do what is good, refrain from doing what is bad and purify the mind. The morality, practice, this is what Buddhism is all about. But it's basic common sense. And in this teaching to his son, the Buddha told him, he said, look, don't do anything which harms yourself or harms another. And do anything which helps you, which brings you happiness or brings happiness to others. He said, that's your precepts. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if people could do that? If they could live their life according to those two principles, not doing anything which harms yourself or harms another, never doing, always doing things which help you, which bring you happiness or bring happiness to another. Because if you are practicing in that way, not only would you keep all the precepts, because what are those precepts anyway? They're just doing things which give you happiness and bring happiness to others. They stop doing things which harm you and harm others. Why would you want to harm yourself? You know why people harm themselves? Because they don't realize what they're doing. They've been told it's fun. They've been told it's a good thing to do. And instead of like coming to truth, experience for themselves, they go and believe what other people say. If you notice the feelings in the body, you find that anger hurts you. It harms you and it harms others. It's our cultural response, but if you look deeply and you figure these things out for yourself, not through theory, but through experience, you will see inside of you, it hurts. It harms. It makes me sick. It makes me ill. It takes away my happiness. It takes away my freedom. Why should I have this happen? It's the same with all these other emotions. Once you start to come to the feelings in the body, you realize what harms you and others, what brings you happiness and what brings others happiness. And this is where all the positive emotions which come up. You know, they're not just love, but inspiration. Sometimes that we don't have moments of inspiration in our world anymore. Things which really uplift us. Things which when we see we feel so good about when we see someone else do something tremendously wonderful in the world. We see a great act of kindness, an act of generosity, an act of goodness in the world. When we see things like that, people forgiving. Now we see, um, somebody sent me a, a, a cutting from a newspaper some time ago of uh, an event which happened in South Africa in the Truth and Reconciliation Committees, which after the end of apartheid in South Africa, there was this panel which if, uh, was investigating some of the terrible crimes which were done under that regime on both sides. <laughs> I think in this one particular case, there was a woman who, whose son had been tortured and killed by one of the security officers in South Africa. And this fellow who was guilty of this terrible crime was forced to confess to what he'd done. And the mother of this child went over to him and hugged him and forgave him and wanted to be his friend. I cannot really do justice to what I read. I'm just remembering it. But it was a wonderful occasion. It inspired so many people to see that a mother who'd had her son tortured and killed could rise to such degree of forgiveness. It inspired so many people because it gave them hope that in other conflicts in the world there was another way out other than revenge and punishment. It was an inspirational thing which I read. 
And when you read moments, things of inspiration, I also focus on what that does to my body. How it feels inside me when I'm inspired by some wonderful thing I read in the newspapers or something which somebody tells me about. How people rise above the average. Because those moments of inspiration, I feel them in my body and there's a sense of pleasure in that body. A sense of openness and happiness. Again, I'm realizing that focus on the body is telling me <coughs> that what is going to help other people and help myself and what is going to harm others and harm myself. So by focusing on that body, we're coming to a truth which we don't need to read about in books because we can feel it in our present moment right now as a truth which we cannot deny. It shows us why we do have morality. Anyone who drinks alcohol, if you really see what that does to your body, not just when you're drinking alcohol, because that takes away a lot of mindfulness, but what it feels like the following day. You soon know that it gives rise to a, a harmful feeling in the body. So this is actually the way that mindfulness of the body, that can protect you from so many difficult things. And it, uh, it generates the reason to be good people, because it feels good. I mean, it feels good inside the body. So the positive emotions like inspiration, they can start to get you um, empowered to actually to go deeper into this body um, investigation. And as one focuses on this body more and more, one finds that the best of these emotions which you can get into this body is this emotion of like peace. And peace is not something which is a negative, it's a positive emotion in the world. Which is why that at the end of every meditation which I teach these days, I always ask people to how do you feel at the end? Can you understand what that peace is? There's an experience in the body. What's it like when the mind is at peace? How does it feel inside on the body? Because a lot of times that we're still just focused on that body. When you experience just how powerful peace is, just what it feels like. It's just one of the greatest pleasures of the world. And when we know that peace is a greatest pleasure, this is what the Buddha said, you know, the, happily, there's no greater happiness than peace. Then that will inform our lives, what we really want to aim for in life. Why is it that people get so distracted and want to do so much? Why is it that people want to get excited all the time and go to movies and get scared out of their wits? Or go and see sort of romances where they feel you know, so sad and they cry their eyes out. One of the Thai ladies, she told me that her mother, when they were growing up in Bangkok, would always go every week to see the Chinese movies. And every week she'd come back with red eyes. Every week she would cry. So this tiger asked her mother, he said, what are you doing this for? You know, you're sort of torturing yourself every week. You get so depressed and sad. She said, oh, but I like to cry. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Why do people like those emotions of fear or sadness? And again, because they don't know the better emotions of peace. Why is it that people run around in the world so much? Because they don't know anything else. They don't know how to be peaceful. What is peaceful? They don't value that peace inside the heart, inside the moment. Now why do we always work so hard? Do you really need to work that hard? A lot of the times it's because we don't know peace. When we have moments of peace, we always try and throw them away and fill them up with something else. What are you doing this weekend? Wouldn't it be wonderful to do nothing this weekend? You've got to do all these other things. Why? Because you think those other things are more valuable. That's why. You've got to get all these other things out of the way before you can have a moment of peace. Please get your moments of peace out of the way, first of all, before you do other things. Try that. Get your meditation out of the way, first of all. Your hours meditation or whatever. And then go and do the dishes afterwards. Or is it always the case we do these other things first of all? Whenever are you going to find peace in your life? You'll find peace in your life when you know what peace is and you start to value it. 
is important. Just after uh, our retreat period in October, I went to a, a, a loss and grief conference. And I was uh, especially focusing on how to let go of grief when you've lost someone. And there was one lady came to me afterwards and she said she'd lost her son or daughter, I can't remember which, about a year ago. <laughs> and she said that she was angry at me, upset at me. She said, you know, what are you say? Are you saying that grief is wrong? It made me feel even worse because I still grieve terribly for my, for my child. I feel even worse now because you make me feel guilty that I'm grieving. And when I was looking at her, you you can understand that she does not want to let go of her grief. That she's celebrating it. That she's into that painful feeling. And it's become so close to her for so long, she doesn't know anything else. It's just so hard for her to even contemplate peace. For such a person, it would be marvellous if you can get them to come and do a little bit of meditation so they can have a moment of peace. Sneak up on it and it comes to you and you know what it's like. Once a person experiences that peace, even if it's only a feeling in the body, and they realise that for the whole of that year they've been living in a prison cell and the door has been open, they could have escaped any time. It's just like many prisoners who've been there too long. Even though their sentence is over, they feel so ill at ease out there in the free world. They just want to go back into jail and stay there. They've been institutionalized, as we say. They've become used to the pain. In the same way that it's too easy to get used to the grief and be afraid of going outside into freedom which is why the feelings of peace in the body, which come up from time to time, when they're recognized, then they can be valued. When they're valued, they are given worth. And when they're given worth, you accept them much more into your life. They become more important. The nature of the mind is always to be with things which we, which we see to be important. In your day, how do you spend your day? You sp spend your day doing those things which you really s believe are important to you. If it's really important, you'll always find time. For men, if there's a soccer match or a cricket match on, doesn't matter what time of the night it's on, they will stay up to watch that. But if there's a Dhamma talk on at the Buddhist Center of an evening, no, we're just too busy. If there is, I would notice that when there was a Michael Jackson concert on, people would go, well, even they go from country to country to see Michael Jackson. But if there's a, a monk visiting the centre, if it's not within sort of 10 minutes drive, no, it's just too far to go. We always do what's important to us. And the thing is that we don't do peace we don't allow tranquility to come up inside of us because we don't think it's important. We don't know it's important. We think our grief is most important. Our anger is most important. Even our guilt is most important. That is called attachment. The only way to break that attachment is to see that there is something more important, something more important than the grief for a child who's died, something more important than the anger of someone who's hurt you, something more important than the guilt which you feel for something you've done wrong many years ago. There's something more important than that. And how can I convince you it's more important? is actually to bring that up as an experience inside your consciousness by focusing mindfulness on your body. And see what guilt does to you. See what grief does to you. See what anger does to you. See what a pain it is if ever you stop to look. Again, too often we're just not looking. 
so we don't see how much it hurts. Until the time comes, you know, when we go to the doctors and we die. It's a bit late then. Look at it now. It's a feeling in the body. Once you have that mindfulness there, you'd also notice that the times when this peace, those moments of emptiness, those moments of freedom, which do come up from time to time when you stop thinking about your problems. When those moments of peace do come up when you're not thinking about those problems, when you're distracted by a joke, when you're just uh, taken out of your your world because of you know, some little experience somewhere. Then when you're taken out of that prison and you see outside, you just see how free it is, how wonderful it is, how much pleasure it is to be free and to be peaceful. Then peace becomes more important and more valuable. If only this world would value peace, then it would be much more inclined to forgive. Because we don't know peace, because we think it's worthless, that's why we have so much problems in the world. So much doing. Sometimes I look at modern civilization. Why is it that we've got these great cities and all these cars and these transport systems? Is it really progress? No, really. Or is it the fact that we just become so complicated that surely we've got so much, so many things in our house, but no space in our house left? We've got so many responsibilities, but no time. And what really is a measure of wealth? I think a measure of wealth and prosperity is the space we have and the time we have. How often do you feel that you're just really hemmed in? Hemmed in by things. How often is it you feel hemmed in by time? You just haven't got enough minutes, enough hours, enough space. Everything is crowded in on you. This is our civilization. We get less and less room in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives these days. Because we don't value that which is really important. Space, time. That's why I say in a person's house, if you have one empty room, you'll soon start to fill it. If you have one wall which has got no pictures on it, you'll find something at the shop to hang there. The nature of our society, our culture, is to abhor emptiness. We're so afraid of space that whenever we climb a mountain, what do we do on it? Top. Pull a flag on there. And after the flag, what comes next? sort of a tea house selling souvenirs. We can't leave anything alone. In our house, we always have to put things in there. Why can't we empty our house? Why can't we empty our time? Instead of things to do, to fill in our moments. When you have a holiday, what do you do? Fill it in with things to do. Why can't we learn how to do nothing? To have that peace. What I'm talking about here is our society abhors peace. When people go on holidays, some people are wise enough, they take their holidays in the monastery up at Serpentine. Number one, it doesn't cost anything. Number two, you don't have any stress going overseas, going through airports and being checked and carrying all this luggage. Number three, you don't have any activities over there. It's not like you know, the club meds you have where you're always surfing or skiing or having discos in the evening. There's no discos in our monastery at all in the evening. <laughs> it's, it's free. And some people think, well, there's, there's nothing to do there. That's the point of a holiday, isn't it? Having nothing to do. And people who actually do those, or do that nothing, they really have a good time. And when they get back from the monastery after their holidays... They really feel rested. Instead of, you know, what's the old joke? After my holidays, I'm so tired, I, I need another holiday. Has that ever happened to you? So the reason is that we, we just don't know how to do nothing. 
you know, people always look for things to do. If it's a holiday time, they just look at the movies, see what movies are on, see what events are on, see what plays are on, see where they can go to spend the day. Just restlessness. And why are people restlessness? Because they don't know peace. And so the mindfulness of the body is actually knowing what peace is in your body and that will reinforce the value of peace, the value of relaxing, the value of letting go, the value of being kind to the moment. So check out how you feel in your body whenever you know you have these emotions which are coming up in the world. Check out which are the positive emotions. By the positive emotions, I mean the ones which are going to create happiness and well-being for you in your life. Your life is in your command as it were there's a law of karma any of the problems in the body most of them happen because of you that's why the anger you don't have to blame someone else for making you angry you know you can try and make me angry that's actually what somebody mentioned the other day uh, when i was teaching in sydney they say you know just how do you know when somebody's enlightened or not just try and make them angry you know, really sort of wind them up, stir them up. That's how you can find if someone's really angry or not. That's what you know, all the, the great monks used to do. They used to really, you know, really uh, wind people up. The story I told about that was um, about this monk in this, uh, he's, a, he's a Japanese monk. And he had the opportunity to go on a retreat in this island not far from the monastery for about four or five years. And he was just meditating all day, all night. And then an attendant would row over from the main monastery to this isolated, perfect, secluded island where this monk had a hut, would take his food over to him and sort of, you know, see if he needed anything for that day. And the attendant would then row back to the main monastery. And after about four or five years, this hermit monk decided that he was fully enlightened and he wanted to tell his abbot about his attainment. So he asked the attendant to bring over some parchment, some ink and a pen so he could write in mindful calligraphy an expression of the enlightened state. And once the attendant brought this paper, this parchment and the pen and the ink to this hermit monk, the hermit monk wrote in just this amazingly beautiful calligraphy. The hermit monk meditating in the island is not moved by the four worldly winds. <laughs> you haven't come to the punchline yet. <laughs> I think some of you know this. And so he rolled up that parchment and he sent it to the abbot. And when the abbot later opened it up, he read it, the hermit monk meditating on the island is not moved by the four worldly winds. The abbot just got an old biro and scrawled on each line, fart, fart, third line, fart, and the fourth line, fart. And he rolled it up and he sent it, he sent it back to this monk on the island. And the attendant sort of presented this scroll to the monk and said, here's the abbot's sort of answer to your poem. And of course the monk expected that the abbot would be wise enough to recognize his attainment. And all he read on his beautiful parchment, he spent such a long time writing, which is this, it's almost like it was like graffiti written on it, just far, far, far. And this monk, this hermit got so upset and angry, that how can he say this to me? Now, Mark is not supposed to be so crude and thoughtless and mess up my beautiful career. I'm going to sort this abbot out. So he got into the boat. And he rowed himself over to the other side and he confronted the abbot. Who do you think you are to, to say these you know, rude words to me? And of course, you know what the abbot said. He said, you said the four worldly wings don't move you and four little farts have blown you all over the lake into this monastery. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you actually you, you check if a person's enlightened or not by, by making them angry so you have to go back to the island for another five years
Because <laughs> why be, you know, why, why allow people to make you angry? What's the point of it? And if you understand what's going on, you can still maintain the feelings of peace and quietness. Because when they're more valuable, it's like I don't want things of value to be stolen. So I protect those things. In the same way that if you have a wallet with lots of money inside of it, you'd always be checking on it to make sure that no one steals it. You'd never leave it where it can be lost. In the same way, if you value peace, if you value kindness, then you'll never leave it in a place where it will get stolen. You'd always be protecting it because it's a thing of great value. And if it's a thing of great value and you really look after it, then it's impossible to lose it. So again, to sum up, by doing mindfulness of your body, you're knowing the value of these positive emotions, like love, like peace, like inspiration, like kindness. And you're also knowing the harm the negative emotions do to you. How anger, guilt, fear, depression, boredom, how that creates so much discomfort to the body. But once you see that, you'll have be on the path to overcoming those things. To be a person who values that which is truly worth something. And when you value what's truly worth something, you'll always be preserving it. And it will always grow and grow and grow. And you'll become much better, much more wonderful, com more compassionate, more peaceful human beings. So when I'm saying this, how does your body feel now? That's the end of the talk. Thank you. Okay, any questions about this evening's Dhamma talk on mindfulness of the body? Any questions? Going, going. Yes, another one from over there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, you're asking the question if uh, somebody is like a murderer or a rapist, or rather, you, actually, you never say a person's a murderer or a rapist because it's not the person. They've done those things. They've done an act of rape or they've done an act of murder, which doesn't mean they're a murderer. That's one of the first things which we should always uh, remember, that just one act doesn't make a person. It's the old um, uh, story in psychology, this... Uh, a woman is taking her son into the supermarket. He drops the jar of honey and she says, you stupid child. The other mother uh, takes her son to the supermarket. And she's been to the Buddhist society before. So when her, son <laughs> when her son drops the jar of honey, she says, that's a stupid thing you did. And there's such a world of difference between saying you're a stupid child and that's a stupid thing you did. There's a world of difference between calling a person a murderer and say you've murdered somebody. Because by saying you're a murderer, you're actually making this sort of the person a murderer rather than you've done a murder. So that's one of the first things on that. The second thing is to remember that even if a person says, yes, you know, that I'm never going to do this again, they don't know they're never going to do that again. 
you know, sometimes they can't even trust themselves. They may say that sincerely, but who knows, in the same situation, the same circumstances, will they do it again? But the point is there that when a person has done something which has hurt someone else, you have to always separate two important responses. One is to protect other people and the other is revenge. So often that those two, you know, protection and revenge, get mixed up. We say we want to execute them, you know, just to protect society so they never murder anybody again. Well, really, it's not really protection. They just want revenge. You've hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you back. And certainly we should notice and filter out this terrible thing we call revenge. And I think that many people would know that revenge, you hurt me, so I have to hurt you back, is never going to create anything except the continuation of conflict. You only have to look at you know, Israel and Palestine to know just what happens when revenge is paramount. So if somebody is raped or killed or stolen, please don't go for revenge because that will just create more hurt, more harm. The whole motive behind whatever you do should be you know, to protect that person, to have some sort of rehabilitation so they don't do it again, to help them, but also to protect society as well. You know, so that you know, if a person has you know, murdered once, it's actually much easier to murder the second time. If they rape once, it's easier to do it another time. It becomes like a habit, habitual response. Even talking with one of the, with somebody recently, you know, if you've committed suicide once in a previous life, it's very easy to commit it again in, in this life. It becomes this habitual response. It's worked once, so you do it again. So, it does make it easier, as it were, more likely. If you do it once, you do it again. So protection needs to be done, it needs to be considered, and also just rehabilitation. And when you have those two responses there, you understand that forgiveness means, okay, no revenge. You know, hurt doesn't, doesn't sort of, is not solved with more hurt. You know, because if I hurt you back, then you, know, you, you, get, you know, if, if, if you punch me, and then you know, so some of my mates in here will come and punch you back. And then you go back and get your mates. And you know, talk to the Buddhist society. And then we'll go back and you know, talk to your house. And it goes on like that. Do you remember years ago, there was a Laurel and Hardy movie? And I always remember this. We should actually get this for the Buddhist society. Cause this is marvellous Dhamma. I think that Laurel and Hardy just came out of their house. And they had this new car. And they just backed their car into their neighbour's car. And just dented it slightly. And so their neighbour, you know, were washing their car, they kicked Laurel and Hardy's car. And then Laurel and Hardy said, we're not going to allow this. And they sort of you know, punched the windows out of their car. And, and a long story told, tit for tat, but it was done so well, in the end, not only were their two cars you know, completely wrecked, but so were their houses as well. Once they finished the car, they started with the houses. And you know, it, it was a beautiful story about just how tit for tat revenge just destroyed both people's property. And no one had any happiness left. This is what happens with revenge. It's one of our cultural stupid responses. Forgiveness stops revenge. Say, so look, now I'm not going to hurt you back. But you can't stop it, just forgiveness. Now you've got to find out what the real problem is. Now why did you do that? And how can we prevent that happening in the future? It's just, you know, just punishing people just like when you're at school okay you know you get punished if you did things wrong but as a schoolboy, I became very smart to, to do those things without getting caught I did it it wasn't I stopped doing those things you're just more smart you knew where the teachers were and when they were coming and you made sure that you know they never they never caught you and that's the trouble with rules Okay, speeding is sort of dangerous, but you now we figure out where all the speed cameras are. So it's still speed, but not where the cameras are. This is the trouble with rules. When they don't really realize the purpose behind them, when we just like you know, reward and punishment, it never works that way. So I would say that in that situation, that forgiveness means that I'm not going to punish you because of that. No revenge is necessary, but look, 
How can we you know, stop that happening again? Why did a person murder? Why did they rape? What was going through their mind at the time? And a lot of times it's, you know, that, uh, you know, not, there might be some pain, some difficulty inside. Find out what the cause is. Let's get that cause, whether it was uh, some sort of psychosis inside, some sort of hate to the world. Talk it through, find out why. It's a way you can heal. So that's, that's what I call the Buddha's response. In the time of the Buddha, there was a serial killer. He tried even to kill the Buddha. He became a great saint, fully enlightened. Otherwise, it's always revenge. We're just never going to get anywhere in our, our world. So that's, that's what I would always do. Just always, Theravada says, forgive, but don't stop at forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't just no revenge. You have to really work hard. Why is this happening? Why are the Israelis just you know, giving the Palestinians such a hard time? Why are the Palestinians blowing themselves up in front of the Israelis? There is a solution there. If we, but first of all, you have to get rid of the idea of revenge. It's a very small country, Israel and Palestine. There's plenty of room there for everybody. As long as we don't hate. Now I grew up in a bedroom with my brother. There's plenty of room in that bedroom. It's only a small room when we loved each other, but when we were upset at each other in hatred, the whole house wasn't big enough for both of us. You get the point? Okay, I think that's enough for this evening. Thank you again for your question. I'm not sure if I answered it well, but if I didn't, please come up and tell me off afterwards. So, you got announcements this evening. <laughs> um, maybe the first announcement I make that it's getting close to Christmas time, uh, or Buddhamas time, and usually that this is a time when every year that we remind people that one of the uh, institutions which the Buddhist Society sponsors every year is an orphanage in Bangladesh for girls who are Buddhists. So this is actually the lowest of the low in the pecking order. Uh, you no, know Bangladesh is an extremely poor country. It's a Muslim country, so the Buddhists don't get much help there at all, if any. And these are uh, orphans and they are girls who are again at the lowest of the pecking order and uh, we have a little poster at the back there about the uh, the centre there we have sent one of our members over there to check it out to make sure it's a bona fide organisation really in need all the money which is uh, we collect here at this time of the year all gets sent there and they buy things like, like rice or mattresses or uh, pencils for the kids so nothing is used in administration and they actually give a list of all the things which they purchase with the money here so it's all there on the board over there so if you'd like to uh, do something good for the Christmas that's a nice uh, thing to actually to uh, donate towards we do this every year we're doing it for quite a few years now and also that this will be the last Friday night talk which I'll give here for a while because as many of you know that uh, on the December the 17th, that I'm going to find my little island uh, over <laughs> to do my little retreat, but I'm not going to write any calligraphy after my six-month retreat. And uh, so I'll be disappearing for six months uh, on a silent retreat. This is a monk's holiday. It's what monks are really supposed to do, to take time out to do a lot of meditation. So I'll be in silence. I will be incommunicado. You won't be able to get to me. So please look after yourselves, because if you die, I won't be able to go to your funeral. <laughs> uh, Ajahn Yanadama will be taking over. He's a great teacher, and he'll be looking after the monastery. And I have great gratitude to him for actually giving me this opportunity to spend six months just meditating in silence all by myself. And hopefully when I come out, all of my, my halo will be more shiny. <laughs> And maybe my talks will be more deep. So I look forward to in the end of June when I'll be coming off my retreat to give some more sparkling Dharma talks.